I want to read from Psalm 37, verses 23 and 24. The steps of a man are established by the Lord, and he delights in his way. When he falls, he will not be hurled headlong, because the Lord is the one who holds his hand. Sometimes we ignore our humanity. We burn the candle at both ends. And when we are stretched and pulled in a thousand directions, and we cry out, I can't handle this anymore. Do you know God is there even in that moment? He's there in that moment. Just like a three-year-old that has fallen down and skinned his knee. He dusts us off, dries away our tears, pats us on the back and says, it's all right. We're glad you're here today. Let's go to the Lord. And let's focus on this moment right now, what God has for us. Lord, around us, it's obvious. Things are busy. The fields are being harvested. The cars are whizzing in and out and going who knows where. The campers are pulling up their steps and pulling out, getting ready to go to another week of work. Tomorrow the buses will be running again, bringing kids to school. We'll be back at work doing whatever we do through the week. It's such a busy time. And we're stretched so far. Trying to keep up with our sanity, our physical health, our relationships, our hobbies, our interests, things we have to do, things we feel like we need to do. It just is huge. Lord, right here in this moment, in this moment of stillness, Help us to know you are God. Help us to breathe. Help us to feel your still small voice. The voice that says, let's sit here. Let's share this moment. Let's be 
one. Just you and God. Amen. Lord, here we are again. We've got spurs on the bottom of our feet and arms that are hurting. Me with Roger and Betty as they're traveling to the Smoky Mountains for a month. Give them safety and traveling mercies. Be with Mel as he is also going to Florida on a load. Be with our schools, students, teachers, bus drivers, cafeteria workers, principals. Lord, just raise up a generation of people that are ready for the world. Be with our country today, Lord. We are so torn as a nation. We're torn culturally. We're torn politically. We're torn spiritually from the one nation of God that we started out being. Remind us that you are always there, that you have always been there. Heal our land. In Jesus' name.
this series called No Hesitation, which is a little bit ironic when we get into it. Verses uh, 1 through, well, 21. Let's read. Now Ahab told Jezebel all that Elijah had done. He was saying, So may the gods do to me, and even more. If I do not make your life as the life of one of them by tomorrow about this time. And he was afraid and rose and ran for his life and came to Beersheba, which belongs to Judah, and left his servant there. But he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness and came and sat under a juniper tree. And he requested for himself that he might die. And he said, It is enough now, O Lord, take my life, for I am not better than my father's. He lay down and slept under a juniper tree. And behold, there was an angel touching him, and he said to him, Arise, eat. Then he looked, and behold, there was at his head a bread cake baked on hot stones and a jar of water. So he ate and drank and lay down again. The angel of the Lord came a second time and touched him and said, Arise, eat, because the journey is too great for you. So he arose and ate and drank and went in the strength of that food forty days and forty nights to Oreb, the mountain of God. There he came to a cave and lodged there. Behold, the word of the Lord came to him and he said, what are you doing here, Elijah? And he said, I have been very zealous for the Lord, the God of hosts. For the sons of Israel have forsaken your covenant, torn down your altars, and killed your prophets with a sword. And I alone am left, and they seek my life to take it away. So he said, Go forth and stand on the mountain before the Lord. And behold, the Lord was passing by, and a great and a strong wind was rending the mountains, breaking in pieces the rocks before the Lord. But the Lord was not in the wind. And after the wind, an earthquake. But the Lord was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake, a fire. But the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire, a sound of a gentle blowing. When Elijah heard it and wrapped his face in the mantle, and went out and stood at the entrance of the cave. Behold, a voice came to him, and he said, What are you doing here, Elijah? And he said, I have been very zealous for the Lord, the God of hosts. For the sons of Israel have forsaken your covenant, torn down your altars, and killed your prophets with a sword. And I alone am left. They seek my life to take it away. The Lord said to him, Go, return on your way to the wilderness of Damascus. When you have arrived, you shall anoint Hazael, king of Aram. And Jehu, son of Nimshi, you shall anoint king over Israel. And Elisha, the son of Shephat, of Abelaga, you shall anoint as prophet in your place. And it shall be at the one who escaped from the sword of Hazael, Jehu shall be put to death. And the one who escapes the sword of Jehu, Elisha, shall put to death. Yet I leave 7,000 in Israel, all the knees who have not bowed to Baal, every mouth that has not kissed him. So he departed from there and found Elisha, the son of Shephat. And he was plowing with 12 fair pairs of oxen before him. And he with the 12. And Elijah passed over to him, threw his mantle on him, and he left the oxen and ran after Elijah and said, Please let me kiss my father and my mother, then I will follow you. And he said to him, Go back again, 
for what have I done to you? So he returned from following him and took the pair of oxen, sacrificed them, and boiled like their flesh and the implements of the of oxen, and he gave it to the people, and they ate. And then he arose and followed Elijah and ministered to him. May the Lord add his blessing to this reading from God's word. Today I want us to think about some things as we think about this title, A Pity Party. You ever had one of those? Here's the thing. And it's in your notes. After a while, we've been going against the grain. Elijah, for a long time, had been going against the grain. Ahab was one of the most wicked kings Israel had ever had. He surpassed even that of his dad when he married Jezebel. Then developed a culture of Baal. And Israel became very indifferent when the came to the law of the Lord. You shall have no other God before you. That is very much against the grain. Today we're going to talk about the fact that even a prophet can have burnout. 89% of Americans today say they have experienced burnout in the last year. Is that any surprise? I mean, we just came out of COVID where we locked up together. All the businesses were locked down. All the schools were locked down. Parents and kids were together. Then we restart everything, and all of a sudden we got inflation through the roof. We got all kinds of problems in the schools. Streets rioting, lawlessness, immigration problems, people streaming in our border bringing fentanyl and all kinds of other things. Is it any wonder that people are all burnt out? Having to work two or three jobs, trying to make ends meet, trying to keep going and trying to keep the kids healthy and fed and clothed and here's the thing everybody can have burnout doctors can have it nurses can have it airplane pilots can have it air traffic controllers can have it Parents can have it. Students can have it. And volunteers and churches can have it. See, we've just experienced this anniversary that we had last week. 200 years. And the place was packed. It took a lot of mailings, a lot of planning. And just like all you women know, after you have prepared this wonderful meal, and it's gone in 30 minutes. You've been going against the grain. Maybe for weeks. And in And after a while of going against the grain, you began to feel the drain. For Elijah, he was spiritually off. Remember, he had faced on top of Mount Carmel 
150 prophets of Baal and 400 prophets of the Asherah and an indifferent Israelite population that had come to see what was going to happen. He had faced a three-year drought. But when Jezebel said, if by tomorrow you are not dead like all these prophets, I haven't done my job. I'm going to rid the earth of you, Elijah. And it says he was afraid and ran. He spiritually saw this woman, who was not even a legitimate king, domineering woman, yes, manipulative, yes, but just one woman. And he was afraid. And he was emotionally drained. Think about it. Three years. He lived by the brook Sharif. When God broke him. He went to Zarephath where he melted him. It was while he was there that the widow that he was staying with, her son died and he brought them back to life. But he was emotionally spent. Everywhere around him was godlessness. Took an emotional toil. Most importantly, he was physically alone. In this episode, he runs south to Judah. Ironically, it didn't make anything better because you know who was in Judah? Jezebel's daughter. Married to the king there. Didn't make anything better. But what he did was, the, little, the attendant that had been serving him, it says he left behind a whole day so the one person who could have poured encouragement into him, the one person who get it, could have been there by him, by his side, who had been there through all this, had fellowship together, he was very much alone. He was literally at the end of his rope. You know what his nighttime prayer was underneath that juniper tree? As he had his pity party, just let me not wake up tomorrow. You ever been there? You know what? Moses has been there. As great as Moses was, one person taking care of six million Israelites out in the wilderness. And they just had all these plagues that had allowed them to be freed, expelled from Egypt. They'd already seen the Red Sea open up and they walk across on dry ground. But they get in the wilderness and begin to grumble. We don't have any food. Hungry. It's your fault. We don't have anything to drink. That's your fault too. Grumble, 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 complain, complain, complain. Six million of them. Moses said, just help me to not wake up tomorrow. Paul the Apostle, as great as he was, in 2 Corinthians chapter, the first chapter, he says, we had the sentence of death upon us. We didn't want to live. The persecution was so great, the anguish so intense. So when you've been, when you've been going against the grain and you began to feel the drain, draw near to the one who knows your frame. 
I love what it says in Psalm 103. The Lord has compassion on those who fear Him. For He knows our frame. And He remembers that we're but dust. You know what God does with his servant, Elijah? First, he replenishes him. Underneath that juniper tree, when he wakes up, there's a beautiful, fresh-baked loaf of bread and a big jar of cool, refreshing water. For him to eat and drink. Go back to sleep, the angel said. When he woke up again, again there was fresh baked bread. Water to drink. He replenished his servant. And he related to him. Twice. In verse 9. And in verse 13 he says, what are you doing here? You know what he said? All these people are out to get me. All these people are out to get me and I'm the only one left. You know what? God didn't try to talk him out of it just right then. He didn't reprimand him. As a skilled counselor, he said, what's on your mind, Elijah? What you feeling? Everybody's out to get me, that's what. He needed to get it off his chest. God is the God who will let us get things off our chest. There was a little bit of relocating. He led him from the juniper tree to Mount Sinai, where he goes down into this cave. You know, sometimes a scene, a change of scenery is important. When we're at the end of our rope, sometimes taking a vacation is good. Taking a long walk is good. Taking a retreat is good. Simply staying at home, not answering the phone, Shutting it off. Walking around. Going somewhere else. Doing something else. Even driving a different way. Just a change of scenery. And then he restores him. You know what he does? He says... Come out of your cave, Elijah. You know the first sign that somebody's getting better? It's when they're not afraid to put the shades up. So the sun can come in. Go outside and have a fresh breath of air. Come out, come out, wherever you are. Hospitals, the nurse that puts up the shade and lets the air in the room. Or better yet, loads the patient up and says, let's go down, let's go outside, let's take a little ride. And it was in that moment. It says that there was a big tornado that came through the mountain. Tore everything apart. But it says God wasn't in the tornado. Then there was an earthquake. God wasn't in the earthquake. Then there was a fire. Can you see Elijah? He's got his mantle all around his head trying to protect him. But then there was a gentle breeze. 
That's where God was. See, we remember God can be in more than just the Mount Carmel experience or the rain that he restarts after being in drought for three and a half years. The dramatics, those mountaintop experiences, they're one thing. But what if that very special time with the Lord this morning? And it's like that cool breeze where God says, I'm here. Don't be afraid. I'm with you. Don't be afraid. And then he reframes him. He said, I want you to know there's 7,000 in Israel. You can't see them because you've been doing your thing. 7,000 have never bowed to Baal. They've never kissed anything on his altar. There are 7,000 that are faithful to me. You're not alone. God had some things to be done. So when you begin to taste the grain and you begin to feel the drain, and you've drawn near the one who knows your frame, now it's time for people to ordain. Hazael, he's an opposing king. He's the one that's going to come and he is going to oppress the people of Israel. He's like the dad that took you out behind the woodshed and give you a licking. But Hazael is going to oppress you. He's going to steal your crops. He's going to plunder you. He's going to put on the pressure so that you do the one thing you needed to be doing all along. God help us! And when Hazael gets done purging the outside... Jehu is going to purge the inside. Jehu, is, by the way, is the king after Ahab and his son are all passed from the scene. Jehu, you know what he's going to do? He's going to grind every Baal altar to dust and throw it in the rubbish heap. And then there is Elisha. Elisha that's going to come and faithfully be with Elijah. I love what it says in the book of Ecclesiastes. Two are better than one because they have a good return for their work. For if either of them falls, his companion will pick him up again. But woe to the one who is by himself who has no one to pick him up. Elisha is going to be there to encourage, to pray for, to be with, to learn Elijah. So when we have drawn near to the one who knows our frame, and there are people to ordain, then we can sing the grateful refrain. There's a story about a veteran many years ago. He uh, had come home from the war only to have some heart problems, several heart attacks, in fact, and they put him, and he had to have heart surgery. So during his heart surgery and recovery, he could not see his four-year-old boy. That didn't mean he was think, wasn't thinking about him. In fact, when he got strong enough and there were things in the veterans' hospital that he could do with his hands to occupy him as he was recovering, and 
He made his boy a, a little toy train. Hand painted it himself. And he sent it to his son down through the attendant. The boy was out in the parking lot, went up four stories high, looking to see what the son would do with the new gift. Only problem was when the attendant gave the gift to his son, the son thought it was the attendant that had given him the gift. Not dad that was four stories up. And the dad was poking on the window, but the boy couldn't hear him until mom looks up and sees dad and explains to the boy, that train is from your daddy. The attendant was just the one that brought it to you. It's your daddy that made the train, the train, and he's up there on the fourth floor waving it. When the boy saw, he blew kisses at his dad and he says, thank you, I love your turn. It was fine. There's sometimes we lose sight of who has sent the gift. Sometimes we embrace the gift rather than the giver. Remember those Israelites out in the wilderness? Do you know what they lost? You know what they lacked onto? Lock, lack, locked, locked onto? They locked onto the manna. The 40 years in the wilderness, they had had bread to eat, quail to eat. They locked onto the gift rather than the giver. Corinthian church. You know what they locked on to? The spiritual gifts. Spiritual gifts are great things. They give us the ability to be able to speak in power and, and courage and serve one another in the Lord as a body of Christ. But sometimes we want to possess the gift rather than the giver. See, the gifts are important. The gifts are good. But we go to the gifts and not the giver. We've missed the boat. I love this wonderful chorus. Give thanks with a grateful heart. Give thanks to the Holy One. Give thanks for His gift. Jesus Christ, his son. And now let the weak say, I am strong, or say, I am rich because of what the Lord has done for me. Give thanks. It's not an easy place to be, to have a pity party. But it happens to the best. It happens to volunteers. It happens to pastors. It happens to officers in the church. It happens to moms and dads who are doing their best to raise their kids in the Lord. But in those moments, it is God that comes to us drawing us back to Him, feeding us, reorienting us, reminding us we are not alone. He will never leave us or forsake us. So today, This is just something to file away for when you're having that pity party. He will never leave us or forsake us. He loves us too much. And he brings us back. And he has something for us to do. Let's pray.
Lord, everyone here has been at a place when we were at the end of our road. And we're hanging on with everything in us. Help us to realize we can't let go of the rope because you've got a hold of us. You never left us. You have never forsaken us. You're there to care for us and nurture us and help us to find the way and to send us onto a new direction in our journey with you. Lord, today, thank you for your love. Thank you for that still breeze. That refreshes us. That calls us by name. Your mind. Amen. Let's sing together. Darkness veils his love.